Okay, so good morning, everybody. I was, before coming here, I was saying I will have three to five people in the class. No, four more, so double that prediction. Um, uh, it's fine. Um, so today we, we are going to, to finish, uh, hopefully, the lecture about control experiment. We spoke about variables last time and the overall plan and execution of control experiment hmm? that we said it was, is more hypothesis based, more scientific, and we define that there are two main kind of variables, the independent variables, that is the things we manipulate to demonstrate our point, and the dependent variables that are typically the things that we measure according to the changes to the independent variable. Hmm? And we also said that there are other three types of variables, confounding variable, control variable, and random variable, that we can and cannot manipulate consider according to the different cases, and we have seen a few examples. And all of that is, needs an hypothesis. Needs to have an hypothesis that demonstrated that say, which is the, um, the, the outcome, what we want to demonstrate. And until this point, we said that we want to demonstrate that version one of an interface is better in some measurable way than version two. And we define that as our hypothesis, our goal. And here now, we are going to define better this hypothesis, moving from the handcrafted goal that we define up to now to a more structured way of defining an hypothesis. So what is the hypothesis? The hypothesis is the prediction, our prediction of the study outcome, framed in terms of independent and dependent variables. So nothing so distant from the thing that we imagine, like here. Hmm? We want to verify if user of our app perform a task, a specific task, faster, let's say, than another application. Hmm? So something measurable, something that contains both the independent and dependent variable. But, hmm? we, what we want to do is not verifying an hypothesis. We want to disprove or reject the null hypothesis. So while our hypothesis will say that we want that version one of our application is faster or create more engagement or generate less errors than version two, and we need to measure in a specific way error fewer errors, what means more engagement, what means hmm, what we can measure. We don't, we use statistical tests not to confirm that hypothesis, but to disprove, hmm, let's say, the opposite of this hypothesis that is called the null hypothesis. So while the hypothesis say that a variation in the independent variable will, will cause a difference in the dependent variable, version one is better with some, so, one, some way than version two. The null hypothesis says that there is no difference in the dependent variable between version one and version two. Hmm? So the null hypothesis states that the difference that you want to have hmm, in terms of dependent and dependent variables does not exist, that there is no difference. So we want to 
we work with the null hypothesis to, in a way, enact the null hypothesis with our goal is not to confirm the null hypothesis because it will say that the two versions will not be different. And so our goal is not really met, but that we want to disprove that hypothesis. We want to say that there is a difference. Hmm? So we want to reject the null hypothesis, thus accepting our original goal, our original hypothesis. Hmm? And this difference, why we work with null hypothesis? Because this no difference is evaluating them statistically. Hmm? So we will have some statistical measure that can produce results according to some level of significant. And so we can say at a certain point that the result is significant, is statistically significant. So the measured difference, hmm, the difference that we notice hmm, cannot be occurred by chance. It's not by chance that we have this difference, but it's probably if we, re if we generate if we redo the experiment with the same null hypothesis, we'll get comparable mm, results in a certain degree of uh, interval. So let's say 95%, mm, if we repeat, we will get the same results, or similar results, mm, in the same way for 95% of the time. Mm. So we can say that is, uh, that will open, uh, again, will not happen by chance. But it will be, if we replicate that, we are quite confident that we will see the same difference. Maybe not exactly the same number, but we will say that still version one is better in some way than version two. And we do this again by saying that the two versions, the levels of the independent variable have no difference according to the dependent variable, the things that we are measuring on. So if there is, instead of difference, we can reject hmm, the null hypothesis, we can say the null hypothesis is incorrect, and then, as a consequence, accept the null hypothesis. If this is not the case, hmm, we cannot say, pay attention on this, if this is, if we notice a, a difference, we can say the null hypothesis is disproved and we accept the alternative hypothesis, that was our goal. If we cannot see a difference, we cannot say, oh well, so we, there is actually no difference and we reject our hypothesis. What we can say is, we don't know. Hmm? So the null hypothesis cannot be rejected, cannot be disproved, and we don't know if there is actually a difference or not. So the, the idea in this controlled experiment, the idea in, this, in, the, in the statistical task analysis that we can, can have is always to try to reject the no difference. And then if we can reject the no difference, then it's good, and we can say yes, there is a difference. But if we cannot, we cannot say there is no difference. We can just say we don't know. We should probably run a larger experiment or pick other type of people, or pick up other measure to see if there is a difference. Hmm? But this is central. We cannot say we approve the null hypothesis and so there is no difference. This is something that statistical test doesn't tell us anything about this. Hmm? So defining an hypothesis, we can say let's say version one of our application, our hypothesis, our alternative hypothesis is version one of our application is faster than version two. This is our alternative hypothesis, what we want to have, version one faster than version two. The null hypothesis in this case will be that there is no difference in speed between version one and version two. And we are going to make an experiment measuring time, measuring speed, in a way to demonstrate that that hypothesis is false. 
And if we can, we can say, okay, so we can accept the null hypothesis, the, the other hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis. Hmm? And, and so this is framing in hypothesis, framing in dependent, independent variables with levels, etc. Another component of a control experiment that we, we have to decide is how do we run the study? Hmm? Uh, last time we have seen, we have taken for exemplifying the independent variable levels a linear approach. We said participant number one will get all, hmm, let me see if there is still here, will get all these all these in order. Hmm? So first, the three menu item with the textual label. Then the three menu item with the textual label with icons. Then the five menu item with the textual label in order. Hmm? So participant one will get this, this thing. Participant two will get all the conditions hmm? in, this, in order. For the first one to the last one. Hmm? And this is one way to conduct the study. That is called within subject. Hmm? So remember, the subject means participants. Hmm? So within participants. Which the idea of within subject that is that each participant perform the experiment under each condition. So participant number one will get the three item menu with the two um, icon versus non-icon. Then the five. And so one participant will see everything, all the conditions. And other participant again. The other way is what is called between subject. Hmm? Between subject means that each participant just perform and see one condition. Not all, just one. Just the three menu item. And another participant will see just the five menu item. And another participant will see just the seventh menu item. So one participant will see just one condition. And then after the task in that condition, goodbye, you get another participant. Hmm? So these are clearly advantages and disadvantages, right? So as you can imagine, if you have just three condition, let's say the menu, three, five, and seven menu, with the same task, with within subject, if you have three participants, you have data, three time, uh, let's say three piece of information about the three menu item, three piece of information about the five menu item, and three piece of information about the seventh menu item. Because everybody do the, everything. In the between subject, you will have one piece of information about the three menu item. One about the five and one about the seventh. So you have three times less data in the dependent variable. So a first disadvantage of between subject is that you need much more people than the within subject. Because again, within subject you have three participants doing everything so you collect information about everything. With the between subject you need if you want the same amount of information, you need three times the participants if you have three levels in the menu to have the same amount of information, collected data. Hmm? Because each participant performs just one condition. So this is clearly a disadvantage. And also you need in between subject uh, balanced groups. Hmm? So if you have five people in the three menu item, another five in the second, in the, fi in the five menu item, and another five in the other condition, you will need more or less the same population. You cannot have young people in the first condition and elderly people in the second, because then they are not maybe comparable. You cannot have expert in the first and not expert at all in the second, because again, you want to compare this information, the data that you collect. So it, to be, it should be homogeneous. And this doesn't happen in the between subject because you have the same people doing everything. So you, you have naturally balanced the group. You have just one group that do everything. 
Uh, conversely, within subject as an issue that between subject doesn't have. That is, this thing's called here transfer of learning. In between subject experiment, you don't have transfer of learning. What is transfer of learning? Is the participants that learn how to use the system, that learn what to expect next. Why? Because in within subject study, you have the participants seeing the task with the menu with three items. And then you have the same participant doing the same task with another menu. And then, guess what? The same participant will do the same task for the third time with yet another menu. So there could be some learning in the process. In the between subject, you don't have this. Because again, just one participant will see just one piece of that task with one condition and then the participant leaves. So you, you don't have this transfer of learning. But you need more people. Um, So clearly also the fact that you need more people, uh, you have less variation in, among people in, in the within subject and more possible variation in the between subject because you have different group of people that needs to be balanced. In the other case, you have just one big group. And the within subject is also called repeated measurement, repeated measures because you repeat the same measure for each participant. So it's repeated. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the two main kind of experimental methods. So you want to do a control experiment, you have to choose. Do we want a within subject, knowing that I will ne need probably less people, but there is transfer of learning, so I need a way to minimize this transfer of learning among participants at least. Otherwise, maybe the last condition will be faster than the first one because the participants have learned how to do the task quickly because it, it did it for the third time already. But and this happens to all participants. So you risk to have data that is not true, hmm? that are biased towards this learning. And if you choose between subjects, you need more people and balance group. So to find a way to balance in group. So this is the, the main choice. When you have more than one independent variable, you can also do what is called a mixed design. So mixing between subject and within subject. So for instance, let's take these, still an example. You can have the three item menu as between subject. So you have three groups, one for the three items menu, another groups for the five item menu, and yet another groups for the seven item menu. But you keep these, that is the second independent variable, as within subject. So one group, one participant of group one will see first the three menu item with the text or label, and then the three menu item with text plus icon. So you're mixing between subject on the upper, let's say, independent variable with within subject in the inner independent variable. Hmm? And this is called a mixed experiment because you mix between with within. And then the same things apply. In within subject, you need, you have transfer of learning Again, because the person do the task with text or label and then do the same task with the same menu probably, but with icons. So you still have learning between one task and the other. So this is called mixed design. But these are the two types of experiment that you can conduct, within and between. And then again, you can mix them, but they are still the same. They retain the same property. So. What do we want to choose? There are some general rules. So basically, there are not general rules. Hmm? So there are some important trade-offs and things that we can minimize. So for sure, a within subject requires less participants. 
because we can just have just one big group doing everything. And you don't need to balance group of participants because you have just one group, but you have this problem of transfer of learning that you don't want to have. You don't want to have this transfer of learning. And also, fatigue may be a problem. If you have a very lengthy study with a lot of condition, you have just one person doing all the tasks for all the conditions. So it could be boring. You can have fatigue at a certain point for the participants because it's very lengthy, it's very long also the study. And you cannot do really anything about fatigue. Maybe you can have a break, but not a lot. Hmm? Uh, so you cannot really fix that, but you can try to minimize the transfer of learning. That, that could be done. Not eliminate at all, but minimizing, yes. You can minimize the transfer of learning. How? Doing what is called counterbalancing. Hmm? You counterbalance participants among the condition. So you divide, in a way, in your head, participants in two groups, in groups, and give the condition in a different order. So participant number one will get the condition in the order one, two, three, four, five. Participant number two will get the condition in the order five, four, three, two, one. Participant number three will get the condition in the order one, three, five, two, four, etc. So you make things in a different order to counterbalance the order. Hmm? So this is not a, a random counterbalancing. You can also do randomly, but it's proved that counterbalancing work well for transfer of learning, so for reducing transfer of learning, if you use a balanced Latin square. What is the Latin square? A Latin square is a table, n per n, where n are the levels. So if you just have two levels for an independent variable, it will be, be a two per two table, in which you have different symbol for each row of each column, and each symbol is the condition. So here you have condition number one and condition number two, A, B. And then you have condition number two for another participants and condition number one. So if you have two participants, you, have, you can use this. One participant will do condition A and then condition B, and the other participants will do condition B and then condition A. If you have four participants, you can still use this. Participant number one and participant number two will do condition A and then condition B. And participant three and four will do condition B and then condition A. Hmm? So this is not between the participants, not constrained by the participant number, but the levels of an independent variable. Hmm? So that's why before I, I told you, you divide your participants in groups. Hmm? Because here you can only have two groups. So if you have two participants, it's one group per one participant per group. If you have four, it's two people. If you have 20 people, 40 people, you just have two big groups, 10-10, 20-20, etc. etc. Hmm? A balanced Latin square is, however, not just split in that way, but as a rule. And the rules say that each symbol must occur exactly once for each row and column. So here, that is a simple case, A happens just one, once in the row and in the column. There is no other A here or here. And same things for B. And so here it's very simple. You just have two level. Here is a little bit more tricky, clearly. Because you have more, more number, but even here, A should appear once in each row and in each column. Hmm? In this case, if you counterbalance in a within 
subject experiment, you must divide equally the participants according to the number of levels. Hmm? So if you have three levels, one dependent variable with three levels, you should have, for instance, 12 participants. Because 12 is fully divisible. You can divide 12 by three. Also by four, if you want. You cannot yet have 11 participants because you will have three hmm, groups, so let's say, different. Because 11 by three is not a, an entire number. You have some rest. Hmm? So with three levels, you can have three participants that are too few. We said at least 10. Hmm? So nine we could also have, but still less than 10. So you can have 12. You can have 15. You can have a number that is created by by three. Hmm? So this is a balance Latin square. So look at this, the first two, uh, in which we have, this is four to four, a Latin, both are a Latin square. So they both respect the, the rule. So A appears only here, B appears only here, C appears only here in the row and the column, and same things for D. And lesser point. And same things here. A appears only here, B appears only here, D appears only here, and C appears only here. But if you look at the previous slides, for the four to four, you don't have the A, B, C, D version. You have the A, B, D, C version. So given that both are valid Latin square, balance Latin square, because there are two per two, four per four, three per three, so they're balanced that way. Why the first one is better than the second one? It still has to do with learning effect. Repeat. I didn't, I didn't get. Yes. Yes, you have these. Small, yes, it, it's all right. Uh, you, you don't always, it's not always ABCD, but yes, you have chains. Hmm? You have B and C that came together here and also here and also here. Hmm? And the same things for C and D. Hmm? So you have, you, did, you solved the longer learning to transfer, but you still have smaller learning to transfer. And so notice here, here these things doesn't happen. So here, let, let's pick B. Here, after B, you have a D. Here, you have a C. Here, you have an A. And here, you have nothing. And the same things apply to everything. Hmm? So the first one is better than the second one because you don't have this relationship, this repetition, hmm? this pattern. Hmm? So you, you have this problem with big, like four per four, tables, you don't have this problem with two per two, clearly, because you just have two levels, and it's, it's easy. Hmm? But you can have also this problem. Hmm? So one way could be, let's start with A, B, C, D, and, and then you, you have to move things in a way that you don't have a C following a B more than once, and a D following a C more than once, and a B following an A more than once. Etc. So this is one way to, to do it. It's not the only way. Hmm? So still, a Latin square, both are Latin square, both are balanced, but the first one is better than the second. And we don't have the same problem in the other three per three table. Do we have the same problem in that table? Yes, no.
Who say yes? Who say no? And you say, I don't know, okay. Yes, we have. B and C. B and C. Hmm? That is probably the only pattern in this tree per tree. But here, in this table, I put this one. You have also the problem here, B, C, B, C, D, etc. So this is the table that you can use. I put that here, why? Uh, I mean, there is this pattern. How can we solve if we want? So one thing is to say there is this pattern. It's fine. We recognize that there is this pattern and that could affect results. Hmm? So in the four per four table, it's easier to fix. In the three per three, five per five, it's a little bit more tricky to fix it in a Latin square. So we can either say, okay, accept that there will be this pattern. So maybe there will be in the results some, you know, transfer of learning between B and C. And so I clearly acknowledge that there is. And the alternative that we can have, how can we change? How can we create a table for avoiding this problem? We can't is not totally true. We can't have, we cannot have a Latin square, three per three, avoiding this problem. That is true. We should have a bigger table. If we, for instance, build a, I'm not going to build, but a three factorial table, we can avoid this problem. Clearly, it will not be a three per three table. It will be a much bigger table hmm? as a number of elements. But with that, we can avoid this problem. But you ne we need probably more participants because here we need, let's say, 12 participants. With a three factorial, we need, and, and we'll have, with 12 participants, we'll have three, no, four here, four here, and four here. With the three factorial, with 12 participants, we will not have four participants for each, let's say, row of the table. With just 12, we will, have more, we will need much more people. So if we can have more people, a way to solve this is to use a, factor, a factorial table, a table built with a factorial number of a row and scholar or cells. Uh, otherwise, hmm, we can acknowledge that there is this pattern and consider that when we make some assumption or experiment. If we have, not as well, a three per three table or five per five, so if we have four levels, it's not a problem because we are in the other case, or six um, levels is not a problem. Hmm? And for levels here, we can also mix, if we do everything in a, uh, within subject, we can also have multiple independent variables, and so we can have six levels, meaning maybe uh, one, let's say one level for the first independent, independent variable and two levels for the second one. So three and three, so two levels and three. Two levels, two, two and two, for the, okay, you got it. So you can also mix, so here we have, if we do everything within subject, we have one, two, three, we can consider this as condition A, this as condition B, this as condition C, etc. So putting together three items or five items. Hmm? So three items with the text and five items with the text, etc. Hmm? If we do everything within subject. So in this case, we have six hmm? conditions with levels, even if there are two independent variables. Okay, and this is how to minimize um, learning effect. In some cases, we can just minimize a bit. We cannot solve everything in the um, learning effect. Then we will have, hmm? so this is how to set up the study. Then we will have a task. 
the task that is the things that we want to measure on. And tasks are similar to the tasks that we have seen in the past, uh, with the difference that could also apply to the usability testing. The others, but here is most important that the task both represent the action and discriminate the action. Hmm? So should represent the activity that the people will do with the interface. So click on a button, navigate a menu, so it should represent a realistic action hmm? that people normally will do, but also should be discriminative. So trying to further highlight the effects, the difference between the conditions. Hmm? And as procedure, you will have the same kind of procedure that we already have for the usability testing. We need the list of tasks. We need the methodology within subject, between subject, mixed. In the case of within subject, we will need the Latin square, the order of how the task will be given to the participants. We need the target population, how many participants, how we recruit it, etc. We need instruction, the script. We need demonstrations, probably. We also need a questionnaire, background questionnaire, um, if we want additional information, hmm? or screening questionnaire, if we want to screen people before doing the, the study, to know in which group maybe we want to assign these, these people, or to keep the groups in case of between subject balanced, or to keep the overall group quite balanced, if possible. Hmm? So we need basically the same things that we, we need before, so that with all this information, we can run the task. Hmm? So let's imagine to have one interface that is simple case, one interface in which we have a button that say, I don't know, login, or the same interface with the same button that doesn't say login, but say learn more, or any other text that could be realistic. And the task would be login on the, on the interface or learn more about the application, mm, something that is significant and does not get the same text that is, that is in, the, uh, in, the, in the button, clearly. Mm. So you run the test, you have 12 participants or 100 participants, you do within experiment, mixed experiment, whatever, and you collect. Uh, so you want, you're interested in the engagement, how many people will log in or register, hmm? will click that button hmm? in, the, in the two condition, in the learn more and the, in the login condition. And you get some data. You get that out of, of your 12 participants, you will have, I don't know, eight people that click on login and four people that click on learn more. And you, this is a way to measure your engagement. So we said that this is hypothesis driven. So we have an hypothesis that is, for instance, that the login button will generate more engagement than the other one. And we have eight people versus four. So it seems to have generated more engagement. Um, but let's not forget that we have an, in the, an null hypothesis. That is that the two condition will not have difference. So we, the same people will click on the button in the same way, no matter basically the, the button present for the engagement. And so we need to understand if these eight and four are really different or just happened by chance. Hmm? So if we get the other 12 people, we will get more people clicking on the first one or more people clicking on the second. We will get consistent results or it was just a case that we get eight versus four. Hmm? And to do, the, to, do the, to do that, to disprove the null hypothesis, we need to, to have some statistical measurement, some statistical analysis. That as I said before, last time, we are not going deep into that, so we will keep at, um, uh, let's say, theoretical level. 
and we will see just one example of one statistical test to do one specific thing in a certain type of control experiment that is easy. It can also be computed by hand, basically. That's called the chi-square test. So you have this data, and you want to apply some statistical test according to the number. There are some rules, and we are going to say that. So the disclaimer here is, in any case, before applying any kind of statistical test, you have to look carefully at the data that you have. To, for instance, look for outlier. Hmm? So here there is an example of an outlier, a possible outlier. So participants that took three times as long as anybody else to do a task. And you know that that participant, for instance, was sick that day. Hmm? That they were experiment. So maybe all the time were changed due to these participants. Or you had the computer continuously crashing for these participants. And so it's the only one that is three times slower than everybody else. So you can consider, for instance, to remove these participants from the analysis. Because for your knowledge, it could be clearly be something out of scope. There are a lot of reasons, computer crashing, the participants as distracted, as issues, etc., that will produce this. Hmm? So look at data and look for, let's say, for instance, outlier. And then, once you have a data cleaned, let's say, you have to choose a statistical test that depends on three things, the choice of statistical test, mainly. The first one is the type of data that you have. You have categorical data, you have numerical, continuous data, or not. Some statistical tests work for some kind of data, others for others. Then the information that you require. Do you want to know if there is a difference? Or do you want to know if there is a difference, how big this difference is, etc. So different tests will give us different answer to this. And then the data distribution. So just as, a, let's say, probably a reminder of, we, of things that you know, we can have, we have four type of data. Nominal data. Nominal data are categorical data. Arbitrarily assigned to mutually exclusive attribute. The postal codes are arbitrarily assigned. You cannot say one postal code is bigger than the other. It doesn't make sense to say that the postal code of, of Turing, where Polytechnic is, is bigger than the postal code of the aroma. It is as a number, but it doesn't make sense to make this comparison. And this is the simplest way, of, the simplest type of data that you can have. Then you can have ordinal data. So data that is still categorical, but provides an order or a ranking. The first choice, the second choice, the number one, the number two, A, B, C, D, in, in a certain setting. So at least you have an order. You still cannot say maybe that the first one is bigger than the second. As a number, they are not. But the first one is more important, more popular, more something than the second one. Then you have interval data. You can build up in complexity. Uh, interval data can be either continuous or discrete. So here you introduce co continuous data. And are data with equal distances between adjacent values, but without an absolute zero. So the Celsius temperature scale is an interval data. Because between one degree and two degree, there is the same distance 
that there is between minus 20 degree and minus 21 degree. Always equal distance. But you don't have an absolute zero in Celsius data. There is a zero, but it's not absolute because you go minus, minus one, minus three. You can continue with the scale. That we know that in physics we will reach a, a limit, but the scale can continue in both sense. Hmm? So this is an example of continuous interval data. And then there is the ratio data. Hmm? That is the most sophisticated of four and still has equal distances between adjacent values and have an absolute zero. So time has an absolute zero. Age has an absolute zero. You cannot say minus three years old. You stop at zero. And all the physical measurements are typically ratio data. And you can do different things. I don't know if it's in the written. Probably not. You can do different things. You cannot compute uh, the, uh, an average of nominal or ordinal data. Does it make sense to make an average between two postal codes? Um, you can compute the average Celsius temperature in a month. You can. It's reasonable to do that. You can compute the average of age of the people which is the average age of the people in this room. You can compute that, it makes sense. So you can do mathematically different things according to the different type of data. And according to the type of data, you can apply in statistics two kinds, two families of tests. The first one is our non-parametric test that works with the simplest type of data. Nominal, ordinal data, you can only apply non-parametrical tests. For the other two, the most so say, sophisticated interval and ratio data, you can apply both, either parametrics and non-parametric tests. Hmm? So you can apply, if you want, non-parametric tests for all kind of data, but for parametric tests, you need at least interval, hmm? the interval category, the interval data. They, so non-parametric tests could be used everywhere, everywhere, but for ratio data, hmm, so if you collect information, these are the information from your dependent variable, the things that you are counting, hmm, for this kind of data, non-parametric test has a limited use, tell you very, very little about this data, because non-parametric test has no strong assumption of the kind of data, since you can use it also with postal codes, let's say, and can give you some information. Hmm? Parametric test will give you much, much rich, richer information. Hmm? And parametric tests, as a family, are both more, are surely more powerful hmm? than non-parametric tests. So given the same set of data, interval data, let's say, a parametric test might detect a difference that it's equivalent, because there is an equivalence in methodology in, between the two families, an equivalent non-parametric test would miss. Hmm? So if you have interval data and you have the opportunity to use a parametric test, go for it, because the parametric test will give you more results, more insightful results than the non-parametric test, if you can choose. Hmm? If you have norm nominal data or, or Ordinal data, well, you cannot really choose. You can just use one kind of data, one kind of test. But they have parametric tests. They are more powerful, but they have assumption. And typically, the assumption that they have, then each parametric test could have a slightly different assumption than the others, but the main assumption is that data is under a certain distribution. Let's say data, the data that you collect is on a normal distribution. 
a Gaussian distribution, a T distribution. They assume that there are some rules in data that are respected to be applied. So if you don't have data in that distribution, they don't really work. Some of them don't work at all, gives basically random results. Others are more robust to change in the distribution, so maybe they work well with a normal distribution, but they still work well with a quasi-normal distribution. So they're more resistant in that. Hmm? But still, they're more powerful, but they have some requirement that non-parametric test doesn't have. So in a nutshell, which test we can use in which case? In our case, where we have an experiment design, when we have independent variables that can change, et cetera. So this is a table of commonly used parametric tests in HCI that we are not going to see at all uh, that say, according to your experimental design and the independent variable that you have at the levels of each independent variable, assuming that you have either hmm, interval or ratio data, clearly not nominal or ordinal because you cannot use parametric test, and that your data has the right distribution as this test asks you, or you can, in a way, modify or adapt your data so that they follow a distribution, you can use this test. For instance, in a between subject, if you have just one independent variable with just two levels, you can use a t-test that it's even implemented in Excel. So it doesn't really need some, anything fancy to be computed. If you have still one dependent variable, but you have three or more levels, you should use an ANOVA test, a one-way ANOVA test, not a t-test. So just one, one more level and things change. If you have a within subject, the, the things are repeated. If you have within subject, you will have one independent variable, two levels, paired t-test, instead of the t-test, the normal t-test, and for the other condition, an ANOVA. Slightly different because you have a within subject. And if you have a mixed design, that means that you have at least two independent variables and at least two levels, because you cannot have a mixed design if you don't have at least two independent variables, you typically use a split plot ANOVA. So yet another kind of this ANOVA test. And these are the, the parametric tests. And each of them, in practice, but also in theory, have an equivalent that is non-parametric, that can be used considering that it's less powerful than the parametric test. So for instance, instead of the paired sample t-test here, that is parametric, you can use this one, the Wilcox signed rank test. That is another test that, that have no assumption in the distribution of the data that you have collected, and that you can use replacing to that. And all of these are standard tests, tests that exist since years and years and years. And so many of these are implemented, let's say, in Excel. You don't even need specific software to compute that. So t-test, the one-way ANOVA is in Excel, for instance. The other kind of test, probably not. You need something more sophisticated than Excel. But for that kind of things, just even Excel is enough. So this is just a table for, as a summary. Um, just in case you need to do a control experiment, at a certain point you have data, you have to analyze data as a guide to what to do. We, as I said, we didn't go, we won't go deep in any of these. Uh, we are going to see, and we are going to do an exercise after the, the holidays on this test. Hmm? That is a non-parametric test. So no assumption on the data, works with any kind of data, and it's a test, but just to make an example, 
hmm, of a specific test. Also considering what I said here, hmm, that the choice depends on the type of data, and we say that non-parametric tests apply to everything. The data distribution, non-parametric test doesn't have really preferences for that, but this one, the information required. Hmm? What this test can tell us. Hmm? So this is a non-parametric test, so it's not powerful a lot, uh, but it's still one of the most used non-parametric tests in human-computer interaction and it's typically used for A-B testing. That could be the simplest way to do a control experiment. You have two versions of interface, just two. A-B, version A and version B. You have two versions of interface. You have two versions of a button. You have two versions of a menu. You just have two versions. That is still a control experiment because you have just one independent variable with two levels, so it's simple, but you have two versions. And so one of the most used for doing this kind of thing, A versus B, which is better in a way. And it's used with categorical data to determine whether there is a relationship in those categories. Doesn't say, doesn't say which, which category is better. Doesn't really say if A, if A is three times better than B. It just say there is a difference between A and B. And probably A is better, but that, that is. How much better, according to the data you collect, this test doesn't tell you. Just tell you that there is a difference. So you can, if you have a null hypothesis, or reject a null hypothesis, and accept the alternate hypothesis. Hmm? Hmm? And, and this, to determine whether there is a relationship more formally, is this one. The chi-square test compares set of rates, so the percentage of occurrences in your measurement in case A and in case B, to tell you whether difference between these two percentage are statistically significant or happened by chance. You have eight people in clicked on the button in interface one and four clicked in interface two. So 60% versus 40%, let's say. Or 70% versus 30%. Is this number random or they are really different? If we do the same experiment, as I said before, with another group of people with the same characteristics, with the same interface, I will get similar number, so a preference for the first one versus the second one, or not? Hmm? So k square says, uh, uh, allow us to answer these. To answer, yes, there is a difference. Hmm? But not, again, how big this difference is. But there is. So A is better for what you measure, clearly, than B. And it makes two assumptions. It really makes two assumptions. So still, even if it's not a parametric test, it makes two assumptions that must be met. The first one, is that it doesn't work well with small sample size. So you need to have more than 20 data points. So if you have less than 20, it, it works. It can do the, the math, but the results are not really um, useful and not really precise, let's say. So you need to have at least 20 points, 20 measure. And data points in the category must be independent from each other. That means that each participant can only contribute to one category. So if you have version A and version B, one participant cannot do A and B in the same moment. You can either see A or B. These are the only two assumptions that this test is doing. So let's imagine to have the Portale della Didattica, the same portal that you have, just with, I don't know, instead of the title uh, material in a course description, you have also another title. So half of you 
will see the labeled material and the other half of you will see something else instead of that label. And Polytechnico could be interested if it creates more engagement material or the other label. So if half of you click on material more than the other half of you. Hmm? K-square test can tell us if this difference exists. Hmm? If there is a preference between one and the other version in terms of this kind of engagement hmm? that we can measure for instance with number of clicks. But you can do this because you are a, uh, a course of 100 people, so you have 50 and 50. That is way bigger than 20. If we just do this here, with the person, people present, present here, you cannot do this because you are less than 20. Hmm? So these are the, just the two main assumptions. So let's make an example of how to use it to apply this chi-square test. Moving from user interface to money. Hmm? I toss a coin 20 times. I take one euro and I toss the coin of one euro 20 times. So I do an experiment. Take one money, toss the coin, launch the coin, and 20 times. And for 13 times, I have head, and for seven time, clearly, the other, I will get tail. I toss it 20 times. And this is what did my experiment. And I also have, let's say, a ground truth. Right, if you toss a coin, what, what do you expect? Uh, it's written here, but what do you expect? How many times should came he head or tail? Ten. If you toss a coin, you expect in the fifty percent of the time you get head, and fifty percent you have tail. Instead, in my case, I have thirteen versus seven. That is not ten and ten. Hmm? So my hypothesis is that the behavior of my coin, that my hypothesis is that my coin is fake. Hmm? So it's an unbalanced as a coin. It's not a normal coin. So my alternative hypothesis is that the behavior of my coin differs significantly from a normal coin. Dependent variable, the number of lunches of tossing the coin. The null hypothesis, you see here an example, the behavior of, the, of my coin does not differ. It's the same as a normal coin. So this number just happened by chance. Hmm? And we are going to apply the k-square test, and we would like to reject the null hypothesis, and clearly our goal is that, to reject the null hypothesis so that we can demonstrate that my coin is, um, is fake, is unbalanced, is unfair as a coin, it's not a normal coin. So this is what we can write. Hmm? We can write a table, head and tail, with our experiment here, which say, okay, Head 13 times, tail 7, and clearly the sum is 20. And we have also the table with the expectation, which should be clearly the sum must be still 20. This is important. This is obvious, obvious here because we toss a coin 20 times, but in general, this is important. The experiment and the expectation, the ground truth, should be the same, 20 and 20. So in a way, we are doing A-B testing. This is A, and this is version B, in a way. Clearly, this is not an interface. But we have an experiment, and we have an expectation. So we have number, we can write this table. So if instead of a coin we have interface, we can measure time. And so here we will have time of version one and time of version two. 
sorry, it's A-B testing here, not there. We have A and B, head and tail, interface one, interface two. But we have our experiment and we have what we expected to be, the fair expectation. In this case, for a, to for, for a, co for a coin, it's easy. Hmm? So here we have numbers, but again, in a user interface, we can have speed, time, number of clicks, number of errors, etc. our dependent variable. So how we can proceed, how it works, the chi-square. So first of all, hmm, chi-square is this formula here. It's a normalized sum. It's called the chi-square because this symbol in Greek is called the chi. It's written as the Italian chi, C-H-I. Hmm? It's chi-square because chi power of two, chi-squared. It's the chi-square test. So this is a normalized sum of the square deviation between the observed and the theoretical frequencies. Between the observed, our experiment, and the theoretical, the expectation. So what we get versus what we expect to have. And we need both because the chi-square formula asks us for both. So, basically, in our coin example, this is what we are going to do. We just have two cases, head and, and tail. So it will be 13, our number of head with our coin, minus 10, the expected number of head squared, divided by the expected number of head, that is 10. Plus, the same things for tail. Seven, our numbers, minus 10, the expected value, squared, divided by 10. In this case, the expected value for head and tail is 10. If they will be different, we will have different number, clearly. So if you do all this computation and you round a bit, you get 1.8. That is a nice number, right? And it's also useless up to now. But you calculate that. And this is the number that is the sky square, 1.8. What you do with that? You need, before understanding what to do with that, you need to determine the degree of freedom of the, that statistics, of that computation that you did. And the degree of freedom is the number, the numbers of, in this case, is the number of numbers that we can freely modify without having other constraint of the others. So here we have unconstrained, which is the constraint here. We have just one constraint in this table, which is the constraint. Yes? The? Yes, the constraint is that the sum should be 20. Because we toss the coin 20 times. So that is our constraint. We cannot have. So if we change head, tail should be the new number, 20 minus the new number, because the coin just had and tail, and so if we change, and we did it 20 times, so we cannot have anything else. And if we change tail, same things. Head is constrained by the number 20. So here, how many numbers between these two we can freely move without having other constraint for the numbers? One or two? How many numbers in this table can we, so? If we change here, this, hypothesis one, we have one 
it's, it's Britain, so okay. It, it's one, so we have just one degree of freedom because it, we can change just one number freely. We can change 13, but if, if we change 13, seven is not free to move because it's constrained by 20. And if we change tail, head is not free to move because it's constrained by 20. We cannot have five head and three tails because the sum must be 20 because we toss the, mo mo the, mo the coin 20 times. Hmm? So in this case, we just have one degree of freedom because we can freely move one cell in this table. If we could move both, in some case, hmm, without a constraint, so putting head three and tail five freely, hmm, then we, we would have two degree of freedoms, but here we cannot. One is constrained by the, the number of, of tosses that we made. Is this clear, the degree of freedom? Yes. This is intuitively, mathematically, there is a formula to compute the degree of freedom. That is a way to check, hmm? especially in A-B testing or something like that, if, if you apply the formula properly. Uh, and we have actually two ways of computing the degree of freedom. The first one is called the goodness of fit, and is number of columns min minus one. And the other one is the test of independence. That is, number of rows in this table, number of rows in this table, minus one, multiplied by number of columns in this table, minus one. Hmm? Clearly, for the, the goodness of fit, can be used only when you have one variable, like in our case. We just have one row. So the second formula will be zero plus uh, multiplied by, per something else. Hmm? So in this case, we, we use the goodness of fit and our results is one. But actually, in our case, we use the goodness of fit and in every testing, we typically have the degree of freedom that is one because we typically have A and B. Hmm? So in any case, we have, often, we have one as degree of freedom. The difference here is that the meaning behind the goodness of fit and the test of independence. The goodness of fit say how much an entity is a good fit for the general population of this entity. Basically say how much a coin is a good fit for the population of coins. Hmm? That is actually our case. We want to have the goodness of fit because we want to understand if, our, if my coin is part of the population of normal coins of, or not. Hmm? So we want to compute the goodness of fit. So in this case, the table and the formula are well aligned because the goal is the one that used that formula. If you have two or more variables, you can still use the goodness of fit, you ignore the rows, but you use the, the goodness of fit if you want to get this information, if you want to get if an uh, entity is a good fit for the entire population of the normal, let's say, entities, like in our case. Hmm? So in our case, it's a goodness of fit. The coin is, we want to know if the coin is part of the, of the general population of coins, so we can say two minus one, one. Hmm? And again, if you want to prove, this is the way to prove that, in, in both cases, both in the uh, test of independence and in goodness of fit case. This work, this intuitive calculation work in both cases. But if the table is bigger, you just have to pay more attention here. Hmm? Which one? Uh, to count the number of numbers that can move freely. So in our case, is one. So we have two pieces of information now. We have our results of the chi square that is 1.8, and a degree of freedom that is one. Hmm? What do we do with these two pieces of information? We get, together with the chi square test, we got a table like this, hmm? so bigger than this. Hmm? 
So this table continues here after five and does probably something here in the middle. Hmm? 0 0.9, 0 .9, then will be 0 0.8, 7, et, et cetera. It just cut here in the slides, but there is the reference here to the full table that is pages long. So what we want to do here is to look for those two numbers in this table. So we have degree of freedom one, so we need to look at the first row. If we add degree of freedom two, we need to look at the second row, clearly. And we should look where is the result. Hmm? Let me delete this for one second. So first row here, and we need to look where is the result. 1.8, or is 1.8 in the number of this row, in that row. is not there, right? But it should be something here in the middle, in, in, the, in the portion of the table that is missing. Hmm? So this is 2.7, this is 3.8, this is 5, hmm? so there is more or less 1.5 in the middle, so it should be around hmm? 1.10 and 0 0.25. If you look in the table, is you still don't have. If you look in the table, the, the precise number, but 0 0.25 should be something like 1.6, let's say. So you look in the table where there is, which is the interval that you have, and you can say that your number, 1.8, is, let's say, included between 0 0.10 and 0 0.25, and probably it should be something around 0 0.2. Hmm? So if we, here, we add not 1.8, but we had five, well, it's surely there, but we have 1.8 in our computation. Hmm? So you just pick in this table where the number is, in the right row. So okay, we have yet another number. We have, a, this is called a p-value. Hmm? The number that we read in, in that table, that is a probability value, so it is a probability value, hmm? the p-value, that tell us where does number, given that degree of freedom, is in this table. And we say, okay, it's around 0 0.2, more or less. Hmm? So with this number, we can decide whether to sustain or reject the null hypothesis. Hmm? And we usually reject the null hypothesis if that p-value is minor than 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. That means that we are confident, given the results, that either 95% or, if we look at 0 0.01, 99% of the time, the test results correctly apply to the general population. In a way, we're saying, if we really do the experiment, we will see similar results, 95 or 99% of the time. Depends if we use a p-value of 0 0.05 or a 0 0.01. Clearly 0 0.01 is more, it's better because it's 99% of the time, so we are mostly, mostly certain that these results will stand. So in our example, we have 0 0.2 that is bigger than 0 0.05 and 0 0.01. So we cannot reject the null hypothesis. Hmm? So we cannot say that my coin is fake, is unfair. Hmm? And, and, and that is, if we cannot reject the null hypothesis, we can just say nothing. We can say, we, I cannot reject null hypothesis. I sustain the null hypothesis. So we cannot say, notice that I'm not saying that my coin is fair, but I say that I cannot say that the coin is unfair. Because this is the information that the analysis tell us. The analysis tell us that with the data that we have, we cannot say that there is a difference between that coin and any other coin with the experiment that we have. Hmm? 
So we can say that the null hypothesis is true. We can say that my coin is fair, is like any other coin. No, we cannot say by this. We can say we don't know. Maybe it's a normal coin, or maybe it's still an unfair coin, and we can run another experiment to discover that. But we cannot say, according to this test, if that is, again, non-parametric, so it's less powerful than a parametric test, we cannot say that the coin is unfair. We cannot ac accept our hypothesis. And, and there is. We cannot say there is no difference, again. Hmm? So the evidence that we have is not sufficient for rejecting the null hypothesis. This is the best thing that we can say. And this is fundamental in a control experiment and in applying the statistical method. You can either reject the null hypothesis or sustain, but you can say you cannot derive the consequence that, okay, since I cannot reject, then it will be a normal coin. You cannot say that. You will need to do more experiment to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Okay? So, these close the control experiment. After the holiday, we will have just one lecture about uh, an exercise with chi-square test and the user interface. So we, we can see this applied in the context of a user interface and not on a coin, but the procedure is the same. Hmm? If you don't have any question, happy holiday to all of you. And we will meet again, hopefully, in January. And if you have any question in these five minutes, I'm here. Have a nice day.